probably going to discuss this like a million times. <laughs> a lot of freaks. I am uh, just how weird it's Don't worry, you the won't hear it. You 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 Anyhow, happy Easter! Oh. I hope you guys are feeling encouraged and blessed today. If you didn't get food this morning, um, we did have breakfast. I don't know. I think maybe it's all gone. Um, but I know that some of you guys have things going on after, so I'm going to get right to the word. I'm going to preach to you guys, and I've got some pretty awesome things to say this morning. But I just I want you to um, really just invest in this opportunity, like open yourself up. You may not be a, a normal church person because you're here and someone might have dragged you here. Someone might have said you need to come to church um, or else. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like um, my wife does that to me every. No, I'm just, just joking. Um, no, but seriously, like <laughs> this is an amazing day. This is an amazing day. And so I just, I've got some things for you, but I'm going to pray that God helps me to focus in my thoughts and that I would be able to deliver to you guys some important truths before you leave here this morning. Forgive me, but my um, mind is, okay, I think I'm kind of centered now. I don't know. Um, anyway, it's going to bother me if I'm not a little bit centered. Okay. All right. Why I need to pray. Okay, Jesus, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for truth. I thank you for the reality of your love. I thank you that you are our freedom. I thank you, God, for sending your son. I thank you, God, for the cross. And I thank you, God, for today. I thank you, God, that today we celebrate resurrection. We celebrate the breaking of death. We celebrate the freedom that was given freely to us. Oh, Jesus, may today be a day of celebration. And not just today but a day that we re recollect just what we've been freed from and that we, would, oh, that we would celebrate every single morning that we wake up sucking air, knowing that we have life because of you. Amen. 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 Um, hmm. I'm going to, there's this, there's this spoken word and her name is Hannah Martin. She wrote this. Okay. And um, I don't see her. Is my wife in here somewhere? No, she ran away. Okay, she's downstairs. No, it's okay. It's okay. So I did not put the words on the screen, so I want you guys to just listen intently. I want you to focus in on this. This is a beautiful, uh, just real open narrative of what happened on uh, the, the just – all throughout scripture, the story of our lives from Adam until the point of resurrection. So there's three uh, places in this, this spoken word. It's the fall, Jesus's life and death, and then victory. So, so follow along with me, okay? Follow along with me. The fall of humanity is when the fog began, our desire to be God Almighty instead of human. Degenerates and disobedience, we chose a living death. We try to fight against it from our first cry to our last breath. The suffocating fog is the result of our sin. It holds and keeps us captive, unable to breathe in, powerless to escape it. We stay in our darkened cells with chains of addiction and loneliness. This is our living hell. Our pain becomes our normal. Our sin becomes our friend. As we sit in our distorted comfort, believing there will not be an end. Our souls cried out for a rescue, begging for someone to come. Is there no one who can save us from the prisons of the evil one? The heartbeat of heaven descended on earth. He breathed the same air. He walked the same dirt. He was God in the flesh, living among us, the creator in the creation, sent to redeem us, living his title. He stepped down from his throne. We wrapped him, we, we, he wrapped on our flesh, made this planet his home. 
He brought sight to the blind and brought steps to the lame, healing the lives of the very souls that he'd made. The long, the love that he had far outweighed the pain of the cross. He knew what laid before him. He counted the cost. All the flesh that was torn, all the blood that was shed, he decided it was worth it so that you could live instead. We can't imagine his suffering. We cannot measure his pain as he hung there, his body bearing the weight of our shame. The Prince of Heaven surrendering to death's snare. The armies of heaven awaited orders for the Father to send them there. But God slowly turned his head took his eyes off his son. The son cried out to his father, it is finished, it is done. His body still and lifeless, no pulse, no breath. The creator of the heavens and earth hung silenced by death. Please don't miss the next point. Every word of it is true as he passed from life to death. All that, all he thought was about you. The darkness was rejoicing, declaring they had won. Evil was victorious, for in hell's arms laid heaven's sun. But as the dawn began to break on the three days of hell victory, Christ opened his eyes and took a breath. His heart began to beat, a thunderous quake of glory shattering death's stronghold. He stood and shook death off like nothing as the giant stone was rolled. The evil of hell has no match for him. He conquered death and the grave. The darkness left defenseless, leaving no man Satan's slave. Our God cannot be conquered. He has no match. He has no equal. Did Satan really think he could separate God from his people? The curse that was upon us has been lifted in Jesus' name for now. We are no longer slaves. Our ransom has been paid. Sinners rejoice. Your fate has changed. For you have been set free. Your chains of sin fell off of you when you opened, when he opened his eyes and breathed. Don't tell me he's not enough for you. He took on hell and won. The resurrection is promise in your life that we can overcome. The fog has been lifted. The darkness has been exposed. The suffocating hold was broken when the Son of God rose. There's no situation, no circumstance that he cannot redeem. Give him all, even the deadest parts. New life in them, he will breathe. He will breathe. In John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18, we see the narrative of the resurrection day. We see folks broken and devastated. We see Mary and the disciples completely wrecked by this reality, completely destroyed by what had happened, completely destroyed that the man that they had followed, the man who said he was the son of God, the man who spoke with Hope and confidence. The man who actually declared the fact that he was going to die. They still wondered if the same words after saying he was going to die, that he said he was going to resurrect. They wondered if those words were true. And starting with verse 1 of John chapter 20. Every or early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled or removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, obviously John, the one that Jesus loved. I mean, he's the writer of the book. And said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Simon Peter, obviously John, came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, finally, the other disciple 
who had reached the tomb first also went inside and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. And then in verse 11, it says, Now Mary stood outside of the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had seen that she had said these things, or she and she told them that he had said these things to her. They're looking for Jesus. Now here's the here's the difficult point, okay? Here's the reality of the situation: is their pursuit of Jesus was after a dead Jesus. They arrived at the tomb, she arrived at the tomb, Jesus was gone, and she makes the assumption that someone has carried his body away. She doesn't make the assumption that he is resurrected. She doesn't make the assumption that he's walking the earth again. She knows the words that Jesus had said just prior to this moment. Just prior to this moment. And she wonders, where is he? They must be hiding him. They must have taken him away, or maybe they hadn't heard all the way. Perhaps they'd forgotten. Something had happened in their minds where they did not remember just what he had said. They'd entirely forgotten about everything he'd been telling them. In Matthew 20, 17 through 19, real quick, I mean, now Jesus had, had, was going to Jerusalem, and on his way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, this is what he said just prior to these moments. We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and to the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Exclamation point. He's like, hey, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. This is what's going to take place. I need you to understand this. We are going to Jerusalem. And on the way, he pulls them aside and he says, look, the son of man, Jesus, speaking of himself, they are going to hand me over and they're going to kill me, but I'm going to resurrect on the third day. And even in that moment, even in those statements, even as he declared these things to them, they still did not believe. They'd forgotten. They'd forgotten what he said. They'd forgotten his message. They, they had forgotten all the details pointing up to this, this moment. They, they had forgotten that in his message, in explaining the prophecy of the Old Testament, in expressing the truth in every detail of what he was about to experience, they had forgotten. They had forgotten. And so I ask you this morning, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? Can you say... Can you say this same statement in your mind? I've forgotten. Can you? Do you feel like you've forgotten? Do you look at the story of Jesus? Do you look at what he's done? Do you look at your own story and say, okay, I know that that preacher speaks and and the veins are popping out of his neck and his head and he's just trying to tell me just how powerful and incredible this moment is, but I've forgotten. Have you forgotten about what happened when you opened that beautiful narrative that he has preserved and he has kept safe and, and you started reading the promises? What words of the Savior have you forgotten? 
What promises have you not believed? What commands are you leaving unobeyed? What truths have you relaxed for, for a more convenient alternative? What have you forgotten? Oh, man, it, like, I understand. I would have been fearful, too. I mean, he told them what was going to happen. They walked into this situation, and they're like, whoa, he is the son of God. I mean, he could command angels like I was talking about last week. I mean, you know, at the Garden of Gethsemane, he could have been like, nope, not going to happen. And just at a moment, he could have said something, and all the angels of heaven could have come down and just wiped everything out. I mean, he was on the cross, and they were saying, hey, if you're the son of God, come down. Come down. Like, seriously, you are God's son. I dare you. I, 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 you know, just come off that cross. Come off that cross. And he didn't. He remained silent. He remained quiet. He remained on that cross because he knew, he knew that for our freedom, it was going to require death. So the men finally came to the tomb themselves, and they were heartbroken over the death of Jesus as the women were. It was enough for them to feel heartbroken that Jesus was dead. It was enough for them to be broken because of that. But imagine that their dead savior, their dead rabbi, their dead love, and the person that they had followed, the person that, whose teachings they believed, the person that they had watched miracles happen, the person that they were so connected with, not only was he dead, but now, not only was he dead, but now his body was gone. I mean, it was enough to mourn that he died, but now someone had stolen him from me. Not only has he been stolen in this life, but now his dead body, the remains of him, was gone. Some might say that Mary was hopeful, and that's why she stayed there and, and waited, but maybe not. She knew he was gone. All they knew is that he was gone. In John 20, 11, it says, Now Mary stood outside of the tomb crying as she wept. She bent over to look into the tomb. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you crying? And she said to him, they've taken my Lord away. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. She uses the phrase, my Lord. This is an intimate expression. He's mine. He is my Lord. He is my rabbi. He is the one who taught me. He is the one who freed me. Keep in mind that Mary Magdalene was the one who was freed from seven demons. Her freedom was real. She's a woman who'd been tormented and tortured by evil. And he came and just like that set her free. And so this was something personal. Not the Lord or the disciples' Lord the, or Israel's Lord, but my Lord. She was close enough to Jesus to tell the angel that he was hers. This is familial closeness. And then in John 20, 16, she said that, or uh, Jesus said to her, Mary, and immediately when she heard his voice speak, immediately when she heard Jesus say Mary, at that moment, the epiphany had to be strong, it had to be a bright, brilliant moment in her soul where it was just like, whoa, it's Jesus. It's him. I mean, she had been having a conversation with him, but the immediate moment that he said her name, she was alive. She was free. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, the teacher. She heard her name. All she had to do was hear her name. All she had to do was hear her name. And so one of the things that the disciples and Mary were, were doing is they were going back and forth. And, and so this morning, I, I want to leave you with this statement. I want to leave you with this truth. Look again. This is what I want you to know. This is the statement I want to deliver to you guys this morning. This is, the, this is the truth that I want you to grab a hold of. They went back and forth. Though the situations were grim, the circumstances were difficult, things were overwhelming, they were broken, they were afraid, but some of them went to the tomb to look again, to look again. And there were some supernatural moments that happened after. There was this incredible moment that, that life was, was proven. Thomas, I mean, like some of us, you know, we give Thomas a bad rap. We're like, that's kind of messed up. And he said, I won't believe until I put his, my hands into his wounds. Well, seriously, like who in this room would not say that? Like, I'm not going to believe it's Jesus until I see Jesus and I like for real, you know, like, like 
He was bold enough and brave enough to say, I need to know for certain. I need to know for sure. I need to be doubtless in my belief. I need to be doubtless in my belief. We've got to look again. How often have we walked away from the truths? How often have we missed out? How often have we forgotten the realities that Jesus unfolds to us? I mean, he appears to them miraculously in a room. He goes to them on the side of, like, like there's moments after Jesus' resurrection where he is wandering or he's walking with them on the road to Emmaus. He, he's standing on the shore and he's shouting out to them. There are all these moments where these disciples come to an awakening moment to realize that he's alive, but it requires them to have their eyes opened again because some of them don't even recognize that it's Jesus. Have we forgotten what he looks like. I mean, like, seriously, have we forgotten what he says? Have we forgotten what he does? Have we forgotten his message and his hope and, and the reality that we have now existent in our life as a result of him? Is it time for us to look again? Is it time for us to look at the Easter story? Is it time for us to look again at the promises of God? Is it time for us to look again at the scripture? Is it time for us to look again at the things that have happened in our lives to give credit to who he is? Is it time for us to look again? Is it time for us, you know, Mary was searching. In Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, you will seek me when you, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of my heart. Though he was dead, she continued to seek after him. Though he was gone in her, in, in all reality revealed to her that from what she could see, he was gone. My question is, why do we all need to look again at the empty tomb? Why do we need to look again? Why do we need to look again at his promise? Why do we need to look again at the realities of freedom and life for us? There's questions. The question of skepticism. Oh, come on. I know that we all face it. We read the Bible, read the stories, we read, we read what Jesus said and what he did. And, and there's things that there's moments in our lives where we're just like, hmm. Is this true? I just don't know anymore. I just don't, I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I was raised in church or, you know, I experienced these things or these things happened, but I, I, I just don't know. We've got to look again and allow ourselves to question that skepticism. We've got to question the question of doubts, insecurity, fear. Do we doubt things that God had said? We look again at the empty tomb and all the promises of it. The questions of doubt, questions of loneliness, of weakness, of fear, of guilt, of guilt. Why? Because at the tomb, at the cross, when the death happened, our sin and our guilt died with him and our resurrection life raised within us. So where are you? I mean, do you, do you find yourself overwhelmed by guilt? Are you questioning that or, or the question of death, your fear? We've got to look again. We've got to discover. We've got to be freed. This is what I say to you this morning, okay? I want you to grab this, okay? Capture this. The devil, the darkest of night, and death may swagger and contend. The struggle of life may create pain ahead. But do not fret. The forces of evil have drawn their last breaths. Be fearless. Death can no longer dominate. He is risen. He is alive. He is alive. Yes. Yes. Do you believe and if you are facing moments of doubt and fear and insecurity and worry and concern are you weighed down it's time to look again because when we look again we see the revealed truth of his promise again the devil the darkest of night we've been there we've heard the devil whisper into our ear we've been in the darkest of night we've seen death swagger and contend 
We've seen the struggle of life create pain, but so many of us don't get to that point where we do not fret. We get captured in the darkness. We get captured in the fear of death. We get captured in the struggle and the pain, but we need to get to that place. We need to look again so that we can see our frets disappear. And we can see that the forces of evil have drawn their last breath. We can stand firm fearlessly at death. Man, it doesn't have dominance over you. It doesn't have control over you. It can't take hold of you. Even taking our last breath here on this planet is a promise of heaven, is a promise of glory. The very man, the thief that was crucified next to him, Jesus, the last breaths that he had to breathe. Do you realize just how suffocating and difficult if we understood the reality of Roman Catholic pu capital punishment, we would not even begin to, like, like, we would say, wow, the last statements of Jesus were so critical and so important because they cost him so much in the area of pain. The oxygen that he was breathing required an immense amount of struggle. And he was creating this immense amount of struggle to get oxygen into his lungs so that he could say, and he looks at a, at a thief next to him being crucified right next to him. And he looks at this thief and he says, hey, look, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. So the man dying a death deserved right next to him, experienced the truth that death no longer dominates. That death no longer dominates. Martin Luther King said it this way, our Lord has written the promise of resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf of springtime. Life, life, Experience it. I dare you. I dare you to look again. I dare you. Reading the last part of that spoken word I, I, just, I just read uh, at the beginning here, don't tell me he's not enough for you. He took on hell and won. The resurrection is our promise in life we can overcome. The fog has now been lifted. The darkness has been exposed. The suffocating hold was broken when the Son of God arose. There's no situation, no circumstance that he cannot redeem. Give him all, even the deadest parts, new life in them he'll breathe. He'll breathe. <laughs> Yeah.
So, what now? What now? I leave you with this dare. Look again. Look at the story again. Read the Bible again. Read the truth again. Might have been a while, might have been some time since you, you might have some distance from this story. You may have never experienced the truth of Jesus for you. Not look again, but look. I dare you. I dare you. Yeah, it's scary. We're not sure what we're going to find. We're not sure what's going to be revealed about us. We're not sure the, the, the reality that we're going to come to and all the awful things we're going to feel and experience at first. Like, man, I've, gr I've grown so, so far. The beautiful thing is, is that you can walk and walk and walk, but immediately after you turn around, he is right there standing next to you. Look again. At his truth. Look again at his promise. Look again at his freedom. Look again at the release of your sin and your bondage. Look again at the life of purpose, the life of hope, the secure promises that speak of resurrection in heaven. Look again.